these days people find themselves with much more time on their hands uh, many are watching films or Netflix series or reading books that they otherwise wouldn't have time to do. We all like our films or our books to have a happy ending. We want the goodies to beat the baddies. We want the handsome boy to get the girl. We want to feel good when our book or our TV programme finishes. <clears throat> There are many who have the same attitude to the Bible. They want it to end happy ever after. And of course it does. We're promised a new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth where peace and righteousness dwell. But the problem is, it's conditional. That blissful life is for those who belong to God the redeemed of the Lord, those who have washed their sins in the blood of the Lamb. The story is quite different for those who have rejected God and mistreated his people. And here in Isaiah 63, we get the first glimpse of that. The prophecy of Isaiah is full of messages of encouragement for God's people, messages of hope promises of better days ahead. But chapter 63 brings a different message and we dodge it or avoid it to our own peril. The prophet has been painting pictures of the glories of the new Jerusalem when he suddenly notices something that shocks him. And the something is a figure of a man striding toward Jerusalem from the southeast. He is strong and he's clothed in splendid garments. But in the vision, this man is splashed with bright red all over his clothes and he's marching on Jerusalem. He's coming from a place called Edom. Edom means red. It's from the same root of the name Esau, which also means red. Esau, you may remember, was the hairy man of red hair. He was Jacob's brother. And the Edomites were descended from Esau. And they lived just to the southeast of Jacob's descendants, Israel. So the Israelites and Edomites were closely related. Twin brothers, they were both descended from. But the animosity of those twin brothers perpetuated itself down through the generations and these people hated each other they hated each other when the israelites were taken as captive in babylon the edomites did absolutely nothing to help them quite the opposite in fact we read a disturbing verse in one of the psalms psalm 137 verse 8 we read those awful lines O daughter of Babylon, doomed for destruction, happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us, he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. We balk at those words. We never sing them when we sing the Psalms. Yet they are just saying out of the bitterness of their hearts that Edom helped to dash their little ones to pieces, that in the day of calamity, they took advantage of the Israelites, they looted their goods, they cut off their fugitives. That was Edom. And Edom was descended from Esau, the man who sold his heritage for a plate of stew, and scripture says lived according to the flesh. Here in Isaiah 63, it is from Edom this strange figure strides into view. He looks as if he's been treading wine, trampling the grapes with his bare feet. The juice has splashed over his clothes. This lone figure striding from Edom, the red country, was splashed with red. And it was wine country, its capital Bosra can mean wine press. 
So Isaiah, looking into the future, sees this majestic, strong figure coming from Edom. And he asks the natural question, who is this? Who is this? The figure doesn't give a name. He simply says, it is I, proclaiming victory, mighty to save. No name is given. So Isaiah is no further forward, so he asks a second question. Why are his clothes splashed in red? Has he been trampling the wine? The answer is no. He has been trampling out blood. Blood. A sobering thought now comes. This figure coming to put all things right has also come to destroy things that are wrong. And Edom has just been destroyed. He has trampled them out in his anger because of what they did to God's own people. This is a terrible picture of someone who brings vindication, which means putting everything right. Someone who's mighty to save and yet who must judge and destroy. Someone who is mighty to save, but who has been trampling that wicked nation of Edom underfoot. As they did to others, this figure has done to them. Actually, he emphasizes this. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone from the nations no one was with me. So with his anger and wrath, he brought vengeance to those who wickedly took advantage of the difficulties of his own people. But who is this? We have to understand who this is if we're going to understand this chapter or apply what it's saying to our lives. And the answer is that it is Jesus Christ. And this is the aspect of Jesus Christ that so many do not want to accept. Even though it's written right through scripture, one day Jesus is coming back as judge. He came the first time as saviour. When he first visited this earth, he was pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And he came the first time. He was punished for the sins of the world. But when he comes the second time, he comes to punish the sins of the whole world. Nobody likes this teaching. It's so much nicer to talk of love and have a sentimental view of Jesus. But this is here in God's word. We recite it in the creed, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. But do we believe it? We sing with great gusto, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. It's a nice catchy tune. But do we believe these words when we sing them? For it is true that one day Jesus Christ is going to trample out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. In the book of Revelation, we have a picture of Christ with his garments splashed with blood. We have these exact words of Isaiah 63, verse 3, quoted of the Lord Jesus in Revelation chapter 19. So this is the answer to the question, who is this? The answer is, it is the Son of God coming at the end of human history to deal with all those who have been wrong and wicked, to punish and to destroy. This is the full picture of the Son of God. He is saviour and judge. He is mighty to save, but he's mighty to judge. And God has appointed a day in which he will judge the earth through Jesus Christ. This is the terrible revelation 
of the future in Isaiah 63. Who is this coming? Why are his clothes red? It is Jesus coming to deal with Edom, coming to deal with all those who have dealt wrongly with his people. And we know from Matthew 25, the parable Jesus told, that the standard of judgment is our attitude to Jesus Christ. Whatever you did not do for the least of one of these, you did not do to me. This vision led Isaiah to then relate the Lord's great deeds, his kindness to Israel, his compassion and love, how he redeemed them time and again. But he also acknowledged the people's rebellion, their unfaithfulness, how they grieved God's spirit. And then at the end of the chapter, Isaiah prays and pleads on their behalf. He says, but you are our father. You, Lord, are our father. We are yours. What does that vivid image of the figure of Christ do to you? For some, there is a gladness that eventually justice will be done. We all have an inbuilt sense of right and fairness and justice. We have it from we're children when we shout, that's not fair, he got more than me about our siblings. But as we grow on in life, we get outraged at the sense of injustice, not just in society, but in our legal system. Why did he who did that get off so light? You see, we want to see justice and no less so than at the end of time. But maybe this figure disturbs you. The world, popular culture, teaches you about a Jesus who accepts everything, all ways of life, doesn't mind about anything, it doesn't matter what you do, really. He's just a sugary, inept figure who loves and loves and loves. Well, scripture paints a different picture. Love and justice are like equal weights on the scales. But the thing is, if you're on the winning side, it really doesn't matter. If you belong to Christ, if you've realised that you've no righteousness of your own, if you've come to him in repentance and faith, you will know him. You're walking with him day by day. And you will know that, yes, he does love you with an everlasting love. Yes, he loves you unconditionally. But you will also, if you are walking with him, know his rebuke. You will know when you haven't pleased him, when you haven't obeyed. And like the people of Israel, he sometimes hands us over to our own devices, our own sinful ways, until we return to our senses and return to him. We are still in lockdown. We all, like sheep, obeyed our masters. In a supposed free world, we are being told where we can go, how we can go, when we can go, how far we can go. We are confining ourselves to our homes and not leaving. Why? Why have we subjected ourselves willingly to this severe assault on what the free world holds dear? Well, we did it out of fear. Fear is the strongest weapon in the world. If I go outside, I'll die. So I better stay in. Fear. Fear of death. The ultimate fear. Fear of death. Well, dear friends, this morning, I'm going to tell you that you can lock yourself up for as long as you like. And you can try to postpone death. 
but it's coming to you as it's coming to me. We are all going to die. Then what? Are we comforting ourselves with nice sugary fairy tales? Or are we going to face the truth? Maybe God has given us these days to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Think of all the energy we are spending hiding from death. Maybe we should use it to prepare for death. Because if we're prepared, and if we belong to the one who one day will be the judge of all the earth, if we are clothed in his righteousness, then the end is good. It really is happy ever after, eternally, forever and ever. I pray that that will be so for all who are listening today that we all will rejoice in Christ, that we will all tell of his great love and mercy, and that we will all pray and make sure we belong to him, for he is mighty to save. Our last song is just featured on those words, Mighty to Save by the Newsboys.